So, today we're going to talk about repeated measures designs, which are a special case of something called a randomized block design, which we'll talk about after repeated measures. And you're saying, Dave, why are you talking about the special case before you talk about the general case? Because the special case is easier to understand, frankly. Um, and like, it's also the one you're more likely to use in your own research or you're more likely to run into in an article. So I thought, why not use that rather than the one that, um, rather than the, the general case? So say you're interested in something like forgetting or learning. Something where you're interested in change over time within individuals. Right? You can't do this with independent groups. I guess you try. But would you want, would you be confident, or are you, sorry, let's change the way I put this. Would you think it answers your question about forgetting if I had one group that had like a 24 hour retention interval, one group that had a 48 hour retention interval, and one group had a 30 minute retention interval, and I drew a forgetting curve? I don't think that answers the question. I'd like to test Allen five times. I'd like to test Matt five times at different, or three times, or whatever. Right? I want to test people over and over. So it's, you can't really do independent groups, which is all we've talked about so far, different subjects in each group. So you want to test the same people over and over again. Right? That's what you want to do here. So any kind of change over time, forgetting, or learning, or whatever. But you can see how uh, this is going to be really important in, well, anything to do with memory, obviously. So these kind of designs come up a lot, or pre-test and post-test. So what you're going to get is a design that looks like this. Let's say it's three retention intervals. The same group tested at five minutes, one hour, and 24 hours. Okay. The same group's tested over and over again. That's what you want, and you know you can do it. It's a question of how to do it. So, there may, you, hopefully, or at least some of you have detected there is a, an issue here. The observations aren't independent. I've been harping on that you can never violate the independence of observations assumption. Right? It's just not a thing. I keep saying you can violate random sampling. That doesn't matter. You can violate all kinds of things. You don't violate independence of events. And here. The subjects literally are dependent on each other. Like, if I'm testing you three times, your scores are dependent on the other scores. Because it's you testing three times. Ah, well, let's put that in the model. So we're going to take our structural model for an, our analysis of variance, and we're just going to build that in. Just going to build that in. So our model now looks like this x equals mu plus tau plus pi plus epsilon. Any score, because grand mean, this would be familiar, plus treatment effect, that should be familiar, plus error. And then there's just an extra thing I've added in here, which is the effect of subjects. I like to think of pi for people. That's what you plus, right? I also think pi is for people, generally, because you pecan pi. So we're just putting that actually in there now. We're just building in that there's an effect of subjects. So now we're actually putting the fact that subjects' scores are dependent on each other, we're putting it in. So now it's not an assumption anymore. Now we're cool. Now we can do this. OK? Questions so far? This makes it totally doable, which is nice. Your design looks something like this. Now, I've got, instead of having groups, I've got subjects here, subjects one to four, so I'm using four people, or we're testing at three retention intervals, and I'm thinking of subjects as a variable. Okay? So I'm thinking of subjects as a variable. I could use individual names, I could have said Mark, Alan, and Matt, whatever, but I didn't. 
I did well because I have to change it every time I do teach the course. So it's one, two, three, four. All right. So we've decreased e epsilon. Right? Because think about this. If we think about our, our if we were analyzing this design using traditional one-way analysis of variance, it would be, right, x equals mu plus tau plus epsilon. But our new one is x equals mu plus tau plus pi plus epsilon. So the only place that pi can come out of is epsilon. You see that? Because it can't come out of tau, tau's already there. It can't come out of mu, mu's already there. The only place it can come out of is epsilon. Do you see that? So we're making epsilon smaller. That's good, because we're going to probably divide by that as an error term, right? So when you divide by a smaller number, you get a bigger number, so you get a bigger f. That's good. However, degrees of freedom are going to be lower. So we're paying for it degrees of freedom. Because lower degrees of freedom mean you have to exceed a greater than f, a higher than f. Now, you know what? It's almost always worth it. It's almost always worth it. So if we did this as a one-way analysis of variance, we have, so all eyes with tension interval, we have three tension intervals. And you can see here side by side what they look like. We have a tension interval with two degrees of freedom for both. Total degrees of freedom is 12 in both. We have 12 observations, so it's 11 in total, sorry, total degrees of freedom. Standard analysis of variance, we have nine for error. Here we have a sum of scores for subject. So we're partitioning the variance further. We're partitioning the variance further. So this 9, we get 3 and 6. OK? So the 9 for error in the regular one-way analysis is now we've split it up into subjects having 3 and error having 6 degrees of freedom. Make sense? And think about it, when you look at an F table, so our, our critical value would have 2 and 9 degrees of freedom for the one-way analysis. And it's now going to have 2 and 6 degrees of freedom, our critical value. So this is going to be a bigger number. We have to now, on the, the, the analysis on the right, we have to exceed a bigger number to get significance. However, we've made the thing we're dividing by a lot smaller. So it's probably worth it. OK? Does that make sense? I really want to make sure that you understand that. I can make it a little more practical if you'd like. Wasn't there four subjects? Is it four? Well, because just like on the three Yes, yeah, there's four, so there's three degrees of freedom. Oh, OK. Yeah, they only lose one, right? OK. Yeah. Good question. Oh, you have your book there. Can you look up the critical value? for F with 2 and 9 degrees of freedom. There's a book right there. Somebody's book. Oh, that was his book. Okay, or you just use yours. Okay. I thought it was yours. So it's the F, the F appendix. Oh, okay. Yeah, so the critical value for 2 and 9 degrees of freedom with 0.05. Uh, 4.26. Oh, okay, what is it for 2 and 6 degrees? See, the number's bigger. So we have to exceed a bigger number. We have to jump a higher bar. But because we're dividing by, we've split error up. And we're dividing, the top is the same. The, the sum of squares, it's going to be sum of squares for treatment, or in this case, retention interval, is the same size. The sum of squares and errors are going to be smaller. We have to exceed a bigger number, jump a higher bar, but we, we made it easier for ourselves. So we're accounting for more variance which is going to make this easier. Does that make sense? 
especially with the, the practical real numbers. Okay. So any design has a finite amount of variation, or a finite amount of variance, and a finite number of degrees of freedom. It's a fixed thing, and it's how we screw it up that allows us to analyze stuff. So we've partitioned degrees of freedom and the, and the variance a little further than we, than we have with the one-way analysis of variance. You can only do this, by the way, with repeated measures because we can throw in the effect of subjects. We can't do that if we're not testing the same people over and over again. Right? So mean squared for retention interval, or mean squared treatment more generally, will be the same for both analyses. But the question you always have to ask yourself, and that's like, I believe the question on the assignment, is, is the reduction in mean squared error worth the loss of degrees of freedom? And almost always, yes. Because okay. think how much, just think about this intuitively. Think of how much variance there is between individuals, just generally. There's lots, right? Look at it in a classroom, and even in a classroom like this, and you're all people who are either kicking us because you want to do the psych honors thesis, or you're taking it because you're in the biology program, and you want to take the stats course because you're insane. That's two groups of you. Kidding. Kid is enough. But it's people either really interested in this for sort of real, for good reasons. You're all interested in this for good reasons. You're taking this for a good reason. Right? It's not like 21, 26. The intro of stats course that many of you took, or you know, any intro level course or something, where it's like the variance is huge. The variance in here is even small, yet I think you would agree that the variance is even smaller if you test the same people over and over again. Right? If I had to divide into two groups, the left side of the room and the right side of the room, or again, two different treatments, or what if I just tested everybody once and then again? less variation in people because we can account for it by using the same people. Right? So I think intuitively it just makes sense. So there's an issue. Is it actually realistic to think that this model sensible, like x equals u plus tau plus y plus epsilon. Does that model actually make sense? Shouldn't tau interact with pi? Shouldn't people be affected treat by treatments differently? In other words, let's just think about it, let's think about it very practically, as a test of, like a, a memory test. So if I was to give you a list of words, Ten words. And then I'm going to test you in five minutes, and I test you in one hour, and I test you a day later, 24 hours. Some of you just have better memories than others, don't you? Right? So some of you just aren't good at memorizing things as others. You're all pretty good at it because you're at this level of school. But some of you just aren't as good as others. Just the way it is. So that's actually an interaction of the treatment and the participants and these subjects. Right? That's a tau by pi interaction. So really, that ought to be in the model. It really ought to be in the model. It's completely unrealistic to think that any variable affects all people exactly the same way. You can maybe get away with that using rats that you ordered that are genetically identical or mice that you order for a lab <coughs> Yeah, you could probably get away with that there. But you can't get away with it in any other thing. Again, with a biological, with, with the system, with the sort of complex living systems we deal with in the life sciences, it doesn't work that way. We all have this, our memories all work the same way. One of the neat things about being an external psychologist is instead of seeing differences between groups, I see similarities, and that's kind of fun. So everybody looks different, but I know up here we're all roughly the same, which is kind of cool. So everybody's brain works the same way. So would that mean that identical twins, their brain works 
is more similarly, more similarly. Twins, genetic, they're genetically identical, and they've had the same environment in utero, right? And they've mostly had the same environment for most of the time, but it still gets suddenly different, right? Because if they were literally identical in all respects, you would never be able to tell them. Part. And do you know any people who are models of so twins? Me. Yeah. Oh, yeah? <laughs> okay, good. So, can you tell you and your sister? Can you, you guys you look at each other and go, I don't know who proves who. Can your parents do that? They can tell us who? Yeah. Exactly. People who know you a little bit can do that. What are you able to? I mean, I can shade visions. It's bad. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, can yeah, anybody who's normal be able to? So, but we've had subtly different environments, right? So things are a bit different that way. Um, but yeah, more similarly than me and my brother, for sure, for sure. But what I'm saying is, people are the same on how we mechanistically have all our, say, our memories work. It's cool. That's one of the things. That's a cool thing to know. I bet you have you and your sister have very similar forgetting curves, though. Yeah, I would. I, 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 put a week's pay on that. Easy. More similar than if I took just two people in this room. But if I put you and a hundred people together, I don't know if we could pay two of those. I'm not really sure. Do you do a lot of like, research on twins and stuff like that? Do you do a lot of that? Yeah? Does it really? Yeah, I would do it all the time. I think. Did you ever did you play tricks on people when you were little? Okay, so they did. See, that's interesting again because there's so there are differences, right? There should be the, even in your case with you and your sister. There's an interaction between that and mine. See, I brought it back to the class. Pretty good, right? They do this a long time. Wait, is your sister going to school too? Okay, I was going to say, because I don't remember, remember seeing anybody exactly like you are. I mean, even though you're all special snowflakes and all wonderful, you're all individuals. Which school? Psychology. Right? So she's taking something completely different. Yeah. See, that's also interesting, right? So it's like, wow, totally different news. How do I know you're not your sister trying to think? A kid. Okay, so it's more sensible to assume it does. Even in the case of you and your sister, there's going to be enough differences that we should think about treatment by person or treatment by subject interaction. So our model changes now. Our model now is x equals u plus tau plus pi plus tau pi. You read that tau pi? It's delicious. Not a kid, obviously. Huh. That's a weird model. That's a weird one model. Because you're thinking to yourself, ah, there it goes. There's the model right there. X is new plus tau plus pi. Sorry, plus tau plus tau pi. Wait. Oh, there's no pi up there. There should be. There's no e. So it should be x equals new plus tau plus pi plus tau pi. Where did the epsilon go? Yep, there's no way. That's not a typo. Well, it's a typo in that there should be a pi up here, idiot. See, but if I stop recording, that will wreck the YouTube video, so I'm not going to stop. Everybody move after class. Dummy. Okay, so there's no pi there. We've exhausted the degrees of freedom by talking about tau and pi interacting together. There's no more, there, there's nothing left that we can't explain. Error epsilon is always just. Variants we can't explain. We can now explain all the variants. So there's no need for the epsilon term. We're, we're just treating subjects as another variable. We're treating people, or rats, or plants, or whatever the hell you're doing, we're treating them as just a completely separate variable. Like any other variable, they aren't. Like any other variable, because you're all very special. Again, you're special, wonderful individuals. But really, you're just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Like you're just numbers.
we can just assign numbers to you. Or we can use your names, but we it's easy to do what you want. Okay. So now it's funny, it actually looks exactly the same. We've changed subjects, right? Into Oh, sorry, we've changed, retain, we take, changed error into retention of the subjects. We just give it a different name. We can now name it. We know it's not error anymore. It's, it's, it's actually very easy to explain. It's the interaction of people and, how, and, and the treatment level, how different people are affected by different treatment levels. That's all it is. Okay. So we're just treating subjects as another variable. See, the numbers don't know where they come from. They don't know that you're all wonderful individuals in your own right. They think you're one, two, three, four, five different levels of human. Numbers don't. Okay? So just treating subjects is not a very This is the little trick, by the way, that allows us to do uh, repeated measures analysis of variance on SDSS if we don't have the repeated measures module. And if we don't have the Because the university buys the software, it would cost literally almost $10,000 to buy that extra budget, which is frankly ridiculous, so we don't do it. And we can, we, I can show you a way around it. It's not ideal, but it works. It's the same thing with PSPP. It doesn't have repeated measures in it, but you can do it if you put subjects in this variable. Or you can get JASP, J-A-S-P, and it does it easily. Don't know why it's so hard for SPSS. I think it's because they can charge you more money for it, so they just do it. Jerks. All right. So our error term is a treatment by subject interaction. What? Subjects are a random factor. OK, they're not really a random factor, but when I talk about humans, I'm trying to talk about all humans. And did I randomly select all of you? No, but I'm not only interested in it's close enough to random, but they're all random sample. We're just going to say it's a random sample. It's a random variable. Oh, they were talking about all that stuff about random effects and fixed effects. There was a reason. It wasn't just for filler. It was because when you think about how the expected values work out, it ends up that we get an error, an error term from an interaction. Beautiful. So we don't test the subject factor. There's, we, don't, we only test the, in this case, retention interval factor or the treatment factor. Okay. So what do you mean? We just take the subject, well, the mean squared for subjects, we don't divide it by anything? Yes. We can't test mean squared for subjects. There's no error term that has the correct expected mean squared. So we, there's nothing to divide by. So we can't. We can't test the subject factor. Also, who cares? Seriously, who cares? What would the groundbreaking result be if I found out that different people were different from each other? Oh shit, really? Ooh, call up science and nature. Yeah, people are different. Ooh. Yeah, I know we're all, like I said, our mechanisms are all the same. That's really cool. But you know what? I can just look in here and you let's look around and see, are we all exactly the same? Let's do it. It could be any very. We can do hair length. We can do eye color. We can do how fast you can run. We're a little bit different. Ooh, yeah. That's, that's a real. That's you're gonna get a Nobel Prize in everything for that. So why would you even care? So you can't test it. There's no no expected no error term, and it doesn't matter. Like it's it's not an interesting thing. About the random, sorry, about the repeated measure design. Before we talk about this, so it's a special case of something called a randomized block design. 
But I want to talk, I'm going to talk with the, the special case first because it's more common. The randomized block's a little different, but it's the general case of this. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So remember the matched pairs t-test and the correlated t-test where you do like different scores? It's kind of the t-test cousin of the repeated measures they know of, okay? And remember you could match up pairs. Instead of just doing repeated measures, you could match pairs of subjects on some variable. Subjects usually matched on the DV, the dependent variable. Oh, you can match on something else, but it's usually the dependent variable. It could be like uh, litter mates, so you have three uh, rats who were born to the same mom. You ever think about that, you and your sister are litter mates? Uh, it's weird, right? It's a litter of two, right? In evolutionary psychology, I see things like, oh, dude, that's real wild. Okay. Oh, you ever thought of that? Yeah. <laughs> Most humans have litters of one. Sometimes it's two sometimes. Maybe you walked a moment into that a few years ago. Women had eight kids. That's a good idea. Women in here, can you imagine having eight? No. no. As I noted in another class, the, as pe there's always pregnant people in the world, so the average number of skeletons inside people is always greater than one. Weird. Because pregnant women have two skeletons inside them. Mind blown. Those are the kind of things you think of when you're high, by the way. How do you know that the red that you see is the same as the red that I see? Oh, shut up and take it off the ball. It's so nice just openly saying stuff like that now. I used to too, but <laughs> now I can't get in trouble. So, it's also socially acceptable. Like, I, if I had a heroin problem, I wouldn't be up here going, it's like when you're, when you're shooting heroin, you'd all be horrified, I would imagine. I hope. So let's do the same thing. <laughs> so instead of talking about me taking heroin, let's talk about doing the same thing with repeated measures in NOVA, but let's, let's do like a matched pairs t-test, but not matched pairs, matched we'll called blocks, okay? So what we need here is something called homogeneity of experimental units. That just means the people in the blocks are the same on some variable. Right? I don't know what the variable is. Usually the dependent variable before you start. Actually, I have an example. Show me a second. So it just means within a block, the people are the same. With repeated measures, we have the ultimate in homogeneity of experimental units. We have exactly the same person tested twice, or three times, or five times. But we're not going to do that. We're just going to test people that have the same level of some variable. This can be achieved, I mentioned litter, litter mates, ma matched pairs, twins, there you go. Do people ask you all kind of misconception questions? Like, can you read each other's thoughts? Do you know, things like that? The last one is, are you twins? <laughs> They're looking right to Julia? Yeah. No, we're not. We're not even related. Did you say things like that? Because I would, yeah, good. I'd be very passive aggressive. But it's like when I tell people in the psychologist, I go, are you analyzing me? Are you analyzing me? I was asking for that the other day, and I was like, excuse me? No, you know what the answer is? I'm talking already, you're an exceedingly simple person. <laughs> That's a good one. Or I tell them I can, you know, yeah, I can. Can you read minds? I mean, I've got a rare genetic condition, albinism. So yeah, okay, you know, so kinds of weird things. One person said, "What's your life expectancy?" I said, "Well, it's at least 54." Because I'm 54, I'm still here. Yeah, I'm magic. Anyway, I feel the pain. As Bill Clinton, I was doing there. 
references as fresh as your parents' childhood. So, so we're going to block on a variable. So we call this variable, and then we block, and we call it a nuisance variable. Because we can measure it, but it's going to get in the way. So it's a nuisance. Right? Not unlike statistics, it's a nuisance. So this reduces error, which gives us more power. Because we can explain some of the variance. And the example I'm going to use is going to be like past experience with something. It's, it's, it's one you might use here. The structural model we're going to end up having is, is pretty much the same as the one we had at the beginning. So it's not going to have the interaction. Okay, it's going to have, well, it's going to be this. X equals mu plus tau plus pi plus epsilon. So there is no interaction in this. We're saying that within each group, people are exactly the same. Within each block, I'm sorry, people are exactly the same on some variable. Any score equals a grand mean plus the treatment effect plus the block effect plus the residual. Okay. So any score equals a grand mean plus treatment plus blocks plus the residual. There's assumptions here. There's always assumptions. This is, the, this is for the general case and the special case. The sum of the treatment effects equals zero. That's always the case. That both error and the block effect, and that can be a block or people, if, you, if, you're, if you're using the special case, which is randomized, oh, which is repeated measures. Um, they're normal and independent with a mean of zero and a variance of sigma squared sub pi or sigma squared sub epsilon, depending on the thing you're interested in. Epsilon is independent of pi. So, Any error we have, you can't tell anything but that error from the block sum. Okay? They're independent of each other. There's no pi by epsilon interaction. There's no interactions at all. Okay? There's no interactions, no tau by pi interactions, nothing. There's no interactions. It's all main effects, and that's it. Now, is that realistic? Probably not. There's going to be interaction. But because there's nothing in the model, because there's nothing in the model, uh, we hope the interactions are small. Because there's only one place. If there's interaction, there it is. Where is it going to go? There's only one place it can go, and that's into error. I'll explain variance. And we want error to be small. Right? Okay. So what if there is an interaction? Well, epsilon decreases, or sorry, increases, it goes up. So you lose power. The good thing is, if you have interactions, you're not going to say things happen that didn't happen. You're not going to have more false positives, but you're going to have false negatives. You don't want those. You want as much power as you can so you can find stuff that's actually there. So <laughs> the advice I can give you, if you want to use one of these kind of models is uh, this kind of design says don't have any interactions. And you're going to say, Dave, how do I know there's not going to be any interactions? And I'm going to answer you with a very good question. You can't actually look that. Right? Like if you, here's an example. Okay? This is just something I made up. We've got low, medium, and high levels. We've got three people in each block. And I like to think of this as a as a language learning example, right? So, how long do you have to take French for in Ontario? I didn't go to school, high school in Ontario since a long time ago. Till grade nine. Till grade nine, that's it? That's appalling. Anyway, so some people only take French up to grade nine. They are not remotely functional and bilingual. They can maybe read some signs. Then some people do French immersion, which also doesn't really make you bilingual, but whatever. But you take a lot, you do school in French. And then finally, some people go to French schools. Right? Right, Matt? Some people go to French schools, yeah. So if you're going to language learning example, I would imagine that people like 
that only goes friend, take friendship to great time are going to be like a block. Like prior knowledge would be something. And then probably a lot of you, well, you got a lot of you, somebody you may, anyone here do friendship or Okay, yeah. So, do you feel confident when you speak in French? Like, can you do it? But, well, like, I can, when I'm reading and stuff like that, I'm fine. Yeah. But, like, I know my one teacher that came from Quebec came and talked at her normal pace. Yeah, you're sure. I would get bits and pieces and be able to string it together, but am I getting the whole conversation? Yeah, exactly. So, you can, you're sort of functionally bilingual, right? But still, you're way ahead of people who only took up to grade them. Right? You're way ahead. And then someone, Matt, went to, went to French school, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, Matt, I'm, I'm working with the assumption Matt's bilingual. Right? So, we can do the rest of the class. Matt and I can just speak French, and you give snippets of it, and the rest of you can screw. But, um, so, the thing is, if we were doing language learning, three different methods, people like Matt are different. And people are different, and people are different. Everybody's different, in, but they're the same in their own way. And we would explain a lot of variants, wouldn't we? So let's put people, we have three people here in the high level, three people in the medium, three people in the low. What were the three teaching methods? I don't know for teaching some French thing. <sighs> Method one will be the regular language, the lecture, the way that we do it. Method two could be a some kind of online learning swag, no, it's not like that. That's stupid. Uh, oh, you know, flip, you know, like flipped classrooms, you ever hear about that? Okay, it's all the rage among people who think these things are important. Um, so it's like, you do all the work for the class, you, you like listen to a lecture before class that I've recorded, and then you come to class and we, and you do like homework. It's, it's not quite like that. Like maybe, maybe it sounds stupid or what it is, but it's like that, okay? Probably work with your stats. And then, let's say the third method would be the one that was floated here a few years ago that people got all mad about, which was the idea of taking one course at a time. But you just take a class for three weeks and you do nothing but that class. So this class would last three weeks, but we'd do it for three and a half hours a day. And then some people thought that was the worst idea in the history of the universe. Yeah, it's going to be horrible. And some of us thought it was a great idea, but you know. Anyway, that's the third thing. And you might say, well, one of those might be better. And for language learning, that might be great, because that's really immersive, right? But the prior experience is going to have a big effect, right? So that's why you blog on it. Now, let's look at this. When you look, and these are, I just made these data up. These actually are real. There's interactions there. <coughs> Oops. Now, could you do the analysis? Yeah, you could. You could, because frankly, my biggest concern would always be, is there a disorderly interaction that lies across? If there's a disorderly interaction, you can't do this analysis. You've got to find another way to analyze your data. But if, there, if it's ordinal like that, I, I do it because we're more likely to find an effect that we're interested in. I know that's, it's like that with my, speak, with my wife. When she speaks French with me, she speaks slowly. <laughs> yeah. When she speaks, and I, because she teaches French, right? so I mean, she, can, she knows how to teach her French. Whereas when she's talking to, eh, I don't know if I'm her long enough, it's okay. But like if I'm watching, Certain things on television, I'm screwed. Mm -hmm. yeah. But hockey French, I speak impeccable hockey French. They can be speaking a mile a minute, and I get no problem. Uh oh, what if we had more than one repeated variable? Well, why wouldn't we? We've got implicit and explicit memory. We talked about that before, and we got different rotation intervals. Oh, we have the same group. We have a two by three all within. It's kind of cool. So, what's the model now? Duh. What's the model? 
Todos los mu equals x equals mu plus alpha plus beta plus alpha beta plus pi plus alpha pi plus beta pi plus alpha beta pi. No interaction. No uh, error term. No error term the model. There are error terms there. There are things we're going to divide by. But there's no mean square error anymore. There's all these interactions. There's a lot of things that look like they probably will end up being error terms, right? All these things that say, so alpha pi, beta pi, and alpha beta pi, those are probably all error terms, but for what? For which effect? For A, for B, for AB, right? There's a lot of potential error terms there. So the question you have to ask yourself is, which is the error term for which? And you know what the nice thing is? There's a trick to doing this, and it's easy to do. And you're going to say, Dave, but won't the software do this? That's the problem. The software will do it, and sometimes it'll do it wrong. And I actually do it wrong. It'll do an analysis for you. It's just that it's the, because of the way you've put it in, maybe you divide it. If the software is making one assumption, you should make it a different one. So here you go. It looks like this. We have subjects. We have nine, because I'm assuming there's 10 subjects. That's all. I just made that up. We have retention interval that has two degrees of freedom. So it's got, because it has three levels. We've got an interaction of subjects by retention interval. We've got memory type, memory test type, right? Implicit or explicit. That's got two. We've got memory by subjects. That's got nine degrees of freedom. Memory by retention interval has two. Then memory by subjects by retention interval has 18. And the nice thing is, you just divide the mean square, you divide the, mean, the, 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 the thing you're interested in by how it interacts with subjects. So for retention interval, it's subjects by retention interval. For the memory test type, it's memory by subjects. For memory by retention interval, it's the interaction of all three. Neat. So you just list subjects first. See what I've done here? Subjects, then retention interval. Subjects by retention interval. Memory. Memory by subjects. Memory by retention interval. Memory by subjects by retention interval. It's a thing called Gates order. I named it for Frank Gates, one of the people that started doing analysis of brains. And he found that if you listed your terms like this, you could you're always going to find you can always know what the error terms are going to be. It's kind of cool. Any questions about that? All right. And if you don't have any questions, I will see you.